Oh, we could for now. Yeah, but the video is downloaded. Yeah, we just uh, uploaded to that computer, so we're gonna just play it. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, you gonna take the flash drive? You don't you need it plugged in anymore? Oh uh, yes, still in there, but we can we can take this call. because you move the files to the the actual internal hard drive. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you? So, um, like Arabic and Middle Eastern studies. And, um, my friends were new for this. And, like, two thirds of their students were like aspirational military or military music. Yeah, you can take it. I don't know how you do this. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, not even that. Right, I mean, these are like, 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 I'm going to work for the military, and I'm going to translate how to better film. It's so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's like, that sort of like approach to like, uh, uh, Did you get it? Uh, do you want me to help uh, distribute it?
I haven't got it. Uh, did you just email me? I haven't got it. Uh, so Yeah. Um, 
I think when I was done to do that is more in charge. Yeah, that's very So um, thanks uh, to our presenters for coming here to, to share their ideas with us. Um, and, and thank you to you guys for, for being here. Um, so in, in terms of the, the structure of the event, um, we will have um, Maureen present, um, then Jane, and then um, Ali cannot be with us in the flesh, but they have a pre-recorded uh, presentation, which will uh, play for you. And uh, I believe they should be able to join us um, during the Q&A, um, which we'll, we'll have about, uh, about 15 minutes of Q&A after the presentation. And after that, we'll um, officially uh, launch uh, the latest issue of INFORM uh, in, into the world. Um, and then uh, I hope that you can join us uh, afterwards for a, a light reception uh, outside. So. Um, so that, that will be uh, the afternoon's activities. Um, and I will um, introduce each panelist um, in, in the order of their presentations. So um, I'm happy to introduce Maureen Balin, who is a critical researcher and interdisciplinarian of the fine arts and social sciences. She earned her MA in aesthetics and politics from California Institute of the Arts where she concentrated her scholarship on tourism, urban studies and ethnography, and edited CTRL, the Carceral Technologies Reading List, and a course syllabus on NFTs as new media for open assembly. 
while an undergraduate at Tulane University, Warren studied art history with a concentration on critical museum studies and public policy. Warren's work has been performed at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and she was an artist in residence at the DCU Arts Photography, Film, and New Media Residency. Let's welcome Maureen. Versus immersive experience. 
Um, whereas, by contrast, I'm really just accepting that the visual experience just is it is a reality. It's something that we access um, either because we have to through the pandemic or through social media. Um, after that, I moved on to a more tourist tourist oriented lens. The tourist phase framework helps us determine what a phaser's point of reference is. John Murray wrote about the tourist gaze in three phases, um, the first of which being the gaze 1.0. Tourist gaze 1.0 claims that familiar images from our own lives determine what is unfamiliar about another place. Um, we currently live in a time where document documentation should be as accurate or compassionate or capable of corroboration as humanly possible. What we get instead is that we believe in the authenticity without really getting it. And the reason why we aren't really getting it is because the only things that define an other destination to its outsiders are its least familiar aspects. The outsider generates a common perspective when corroborated with those of other viewers, creating the collective consciousness of place imaginaries. The viewer's position as the student warrior relies on his own life to recognize what's exceptional. Pure recognition of these unfamiliarities establishes what is the normal perspective socially. Um, <clears throat> Sontag wrote, a society becomes modern when one of its chief activities is producing and consuming images. When images that have extraordinary powers to determine our demands upon reality and are themselves coveted substitutes for first-hand experience become indispensable to the health of the economy, the stability of quality, and the pursuit of private happiness. The interconnected online viewer as the voyeur operates in the dichotomy of being cultured as in seeing the most evidence versus having culture, which is this paradoxical condition where one's life isn't peppered enough with unfamiliar visual objects. Uh, Fatima Tobin Roni names the phenomenon taxidermy in The Third Eye, where she critiques a spectacle around primitivism in Robert Flaherty's documentary, The Note of the North. The reason for this word, taxidermy, is that she's talking about giving life to something that is dead. And she is discussing ethnographic documentary filmmaking, specifically that this documentary I made indigenous groups of like past Vietnam versions of themselves. Here, I'm tasked with questioning why we see a rural other space as especially antiquated, even from just an interstate away. So I find that this application of gaze identifies non contemporary features, even on just a regional level. The standout aesthetic markers of a rural space negate the conceptualization of any real life progress. As a result, we often can't visualize the coal miner's daughter as a young woman hanging out in the mall in our current decade, despite the fact that we still have coal miners who still have daughters. Part of the reason why this sort of antiquated portrait accumulates is that familiar features do not add to the collective imaginary portrait. If you make a TikTok with a really thick southern accent and make biscuits, people will get what that is and lock it away. If I make a TikTok in Knoxville or inside of a Target, that could be anywhere. Photography is evidence, but outside interpretation has been made crucial. In the case of rural experience, an outsider's gaze is typically considered more credible, where the identification of what is unusual or even valuable becomes calibrated against some more metronormative perspective. For anything to be seen through kind eyes, whether it's quirks, character, or beauty, the setting hinges on an outsider's approval, and the outsider as photographer is the attractive position. Because viewers particularly respond to images and videos that reinforce common misconceptions, their desires become predictable and easily exploited. Many tourist traps in the American Southeast have a demonstrated talent for parting these people with their money via entertainment like the Hattonfield McCoy Dinner Theater or the Moonshine Distillery Tours, which I have loved. <laughs> Of course, the questionable mythology that accompanies rural imagery has consequences that mythologizing the suburbs may not. A significant portion of American gazers envision the rural or the suburban space do actually already exist within suburban spaces. Um, when specific images conjure a hyper suburban version of our reality, it seems that two things occur. First, that rural people operating a completely culturally urbanized world with internet and two day shipping. Um, may consider their experience suburban because they do not conflate their experience with super old time farm. Uh, second, that there is a manufactured gaze of suburbs um, and suburbanness that may be informed by a source other than immersed suburbanites. 
uh, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. Um, and I had actually split my thesis into two halves. So that first section was like more rigid. It was sort of about the physical movement of the human body through these spaces um, and telling the reader about like streets and the insider versus outsider status. Um, and for the rest, it's a little more narrative, um, sort of the evocative currency. Um, and I had started with the heterotopia talk by Michel Foucault, which is an idea he had referenced a few times, but in terms of it being an actual text, I was actually working from a transcription of a talk he had given on the subject. That's probably his lengthiest piece on it. Um, and if you know anything about it, it's actually primarily about behavior and social norms within a space um, and how specific sites have their own rules that we all understand and know that we're supposed to perform. Um, but what I found interesting for my purposes was that he did have to define what it meant to be inside of a space. He speaks at length about a mirror and how it generates this utopic, placeless place. He says, in the mirror, I see myself there where I am not, in an unreal virtual space that opens up behind the surface. I am over there, there where I am not, a sort of shadow that gives my own visibility to myself that enables me to see myself there where I am absent. Just as an aside, if you try to make a PowerPoint about this and you Google image search heterotopia mirror, uh, this painting by uh, Diego Velasquez comes up, which I thought was really clever, so I'm going to include it just so you understand why it's here. This is actually a portrait of a mirror, which is why the artist is behind the subjects. We do understand that a single photograph is a place. It can be a photograph of a place, but if you call it, it's a place. Uh, functionally, a still snapshot interacts with the body and the space differently than a smartphone camera does. Previously, a camera could only create evidence that was inherently in the past, but everything in the post description of the mirror and the mirror place applies to contemporary cameras in a way that they didn't when he was alive. Um, and so the tourist page we spoke about earlier, there's I'm going to skip the second phase, but the third phase is actually about the gazer's self-awareness of his own body and considers the space that he is actually occupying um, and being looked at by locals. Uh, in the near utopia, one sees the facsimile of himself and conceives the place in relation to his corporeal self. Could a viewer be considered doubly outside of this image space when what's seen is not a reflection of the room he's currently in, but is instead some instead some handheld shrinkage of another landscape or neighborhood or parking lot. So now the camera can orient the body in a space in a way that his mirror could. He orients the body, which we can apply to various forms of completely imaginary, fictionalized, stylized, or imagined real spaces. This here may create a non-placed place, for example, by conceptualizing a bucolic scene that is conjured could exist if it's not too magical or too anachronistic to be real. At times, there's no reason to claim that the reality that is represented by a composite imaginary may not exist. That was part of why I chose this previous photograph. Um, the actor, Jason Lee, uh, became a photographer, and his MO is that he takes photos in like Texas and other rural spaces, and in a way that is so weirdly anachronistic. Like every single time there's a car in one of his pictures, it's definitely an antique car. So this is a, I mean, in Texas, I think, and it's not really something I would consider um, real life, but obviously it existed because it's a photograph and he didn't find it. So this mirror, as I've pictured it, is compact in his hand. Uh, it functions in a way that gives us a theater to staring into a world behind the home screen, which generates infinite place images. And in his same talk, he actually discusses the cinema. He says, the heterotopia is capable of juxtaposing in a single real place, several spaces, several sites that are themselves incompatible. And the cinema is a very odd rectangular room at the end of which, on a two-dimensional screen, one sees the projection of a three-dimensional space. This principle is probably the most directly applicable to naming what a smartphone is um, even though the key difference here is that attending the cinema is a shared social activity where a group like you guys uh, agrees to transport to the same place at the same time. 
um, an individual's interaction with a handheld screen, uh, you have this like asynchronous uh, viewing of content from the time it was posted. So that gives us a, a property. To observe a place is often to fantasize the experience of that place. What's remembered and misremembered of settlement types, as viewed from an infinite repertoire of images, becomes the understood truth where the imagined version is internally referenced but not concretely accessible. Um, in our first year, the last year we had before we switched to remote learning, was Nan Z. Da, who spoke with us on melodrama through Leon Lee's Dear Friend from My Life, I Write to You in Your Life. Lee asks, how much of your life is lived to be known by others, to be understood? How much of your life is lived to know and understand others? How much does one trust others to be known, to be understood? How much does one believe in the possibilities of one person's knowing and understanding another? For rotolites and suburbanites, any potential cool points attached to the social currency of these places affects the gazer, whether he sees himself or an absence of himself. One's experience is then held against what his experience could be through the comparison of himself to unidentified citizens. In this parasocial arrangement, access to the images of others becomes one's context of memory. The comparison of oneself to an abstraction of another is effectively a mental autofiction to which the melodrama of memories assigns narrative sense. Uh, one thing that I've alluded to is the question of what is real. The imagined versions of others' lives quiets the insecurity of one's life as something real, where what's real aims to become what is worthwhile. And what's real is not easily calibrated through aforementioned documentary methods. While there is a functional difference between imagery in all forms and photography as a medium, Sontag writes, photographs give people an imaginary possession of a past that is unreal. They also help people take possession of a space in which they are insecure. Perhaps reality is perceived through authentically generated images has an inflated meaning in the contemporary age, wherein compiling enough evidence removes doubt from autofiction. The way one curates himself and his life in his occupied space becomes meaningful. And in the mind that's been wired for parasocial observation defines his character. Um, I had also mentioned earlier that I would reconcile why I keep referring to everybody as outsiders, even suburban realm. Even though so many, so many Americans live inside this settlement space, and the reason is related to narrative sense that we have assigned suburbia. In American consciousness, the suburbs have become a symbol for thoroughly exhausting and tedious identity, characterized by flat landscapes populated with copies of over familiar structures. Some dynamic photo evidentiary maneuver. Camera on a drone is supposed to zoom out to show that every house is cartoonishly identical. Often these characters placed in an identical dollhouse world become stand ins for the viewer who is somehow in the know of some secret, that they are too good or too interesting to live on a block that looks so sterile. The very premise hinges on knowing that these residents are special and yet we're not even always applied with any substance of proof that they are. The symbols that we are able to isolate as meaningful then be deployed intentionally in order to add to the story. And no matter what the viewer's personal perspective is, age wise, they are put in the position of agreeing that the suburban setting meets a not ideal situation. At this point, I struggle with understanding why we care if someone else lives in the suburb, how we turn the conversation into how living somewhere ugly is a moral failure. The user who observes his exclusion from the place sees. He sees has become aware of the place that he does occupy. He then believes that he's also up for observation. Fear of experiencing suburban aesthetic becomes a fear of mismanaging, mismanaging one's lived time. In the final section of my thesis, I wanted to look at the cottage core aesthetic. It wasn't created on TikTok, but it did completely blow up on the app during the most isolationist parts of 2020. Perhaps during the pandemic era, remote cottage tour daydreams became popular because they also made room for the rules of social distancing, fitting the fantasies of a mouth of achievability. 
It must have been really freeing to express one's wistfulness for another situation and not immediately here, but what about the pandemic that's so What we're left with is a melodramatically crafted and aesthetically acceptable version of reality, rurality. Here are some of the most appealing trappings. The cottage floor fantasy, one owns a goat, makes their own teas, makes homemade bread in a heart, knows how to knit, etc. The most important factor of the non time daydream is that one believes that this version of themselves volunteers to live the rural life, completing simple tasks and domestic work performed sweetly. The pre existing contemporary rural community is aesthetically unacceptable. And so the reality is to attempt to go back in time, grieving that one's ancestors did not stake adequate land and break ground. It's a privileged version of rural acceptance, a plugged in landowning fantasy serving as an escapist device against the modern workday. After the initial boom of the mainstream internet sourdough bread phase, the popularity of cottage core garnered some well deserved class oriented critique in this vein. Many have suggested that the aspiration dream of owning land in the woods belongs exclusively to white people reenacting colonialist ideals. The cottage core fantasy places the individual within a blended present past non time. In this non time bubble, one can still rely on the beneficial features that come with planetary organization. For instance, you can still communicate online, order anything you need it. Within this daydream, those conveniences act more as a safety net than as a highlight of one's daily routine. In the American metropolitan city, convenience stores are always available. The urban dweller appreciates the ability to patronize any number of independent businesses, but could always visit Target if they need it or if they just wanted to go. A member of a smaller community would be expected to make sacrifices in the name of aesthetics in order for their rural township to possess character. Character is considered the only redeeming quality of the AC locale, and it is the only currency extended to them. In this way, cottage core would just be accused of being the suburban dream. However, we understand that the appeal of cottage core lies on the past era version of the rural, showing us that the only way that the rural space can be a viable vacation space is when it occupies by long time. The aesthetically correct version of living rurally is informed by this imagined, imagined holiday ideal, and the taxidermy version is considered more authentic than authentic. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, I'm happy to introduce next um, Jane. Jane Pugh is a writer and editor living in Los Angeles. Her poems and essays have been featured in Modern House, Jude, and Hobart, and she is a 2020 contributor to Tuesday a monthly reading series in LA. She's an editor of the fourth issue of Sublevel, a literary magazine housed in the School of Critical Studies at CalArts, and the 2021 editor of uh, Inform. Oh, I was holding up Inform when I was reading Sublevel, the transposition. Um, so Inform is a yearly anthology of student writing in the CalArts Aesthetics and Politics program. Jane is also one of the editors of Self Portraits as Neither Donkey Nor Horse, a publication commemorating Stephanie Meg Wong's 2021 solo exhibition at Hauser and Worth, Los Angeles, presented as part of the Critical Studies Residency Program and curated by AC Smith. She is currently the Director of Communications at Night Gallery, a contemporary art gallery in California. Welcome, Jane. Wherever you're Sorry, that was kind of a question on the fly. Who I wanted to ask? Um, hey everyone. Um, thank you, Michael, for the invitation to the department. Like Marie mentioned, I don't think we've been here in over a year and a half in a pretty long time. Um, this room is the same, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's good to see all of you. Um, and this is really cool. So thank you for coming. 
Um, I'm going to read from the second chapter of my thesis, um, which is uh, kind of covers three different uh, avant-garde manifestos in order to look at this one manifesto that was written at Black Mountain College. Um, I'm just like for clarity and brevity, going to skip the um, second manifesto that I look at, which is the um, Bauhaus manifesto, um, to focus on the first and third, which are specifically focused on poetry um, and kind of speak more to like the overarching themes of the piece in general. So just wanted to give that little preamble. Um, if there are some pauses, I appreciate your generosity as I find this. Um, this paper is centered around Black Mountain College, an experimental unaccredited art school that operated from 1933 until 1957 in the rural Swanoa Valley of North Carolina. Often in cultural and art historical memory, Black Mountain College is discussed as an experiment. The nature of the experiment is predominantly either social, an experiment in community, or aesthetic, an experiment in art. The experiment is rarely apprehended as a political one, despite the school's strong rhetorical commitment to progressive democracy and the influence of the highly politicized European avant-garde. In this paper, I draw upon the political philosophy of the French Greek philosopher Cornelius Castorianus understand Black Mountain College as a political experiment wherein social and aesthetic aspirations converged in a single project for autonomous self-expression. The notion of autonomy is a catalyzing force in social life, in politics, and in art. For Castoriadis, autonomy is marked by an ability to decide and a willingness to transform both on an individual and a collective scale. Life and its entanglements must be recognized as unstable and society as a living entity in constant need of maintenance and modification in order to function. At Black Mountain College, art making was conceived as a primary mechanism through which individuals could develop their autonomy and realize themselves as inherently political beings, whose participation was required to sustain a democratic society. Approaching Black Mountain pedagogy, literature, and aesthetic interventions in such terms, I reorient the discussion of the policy of treatment to the political dimensions of the European and American avant-garde, external education, and the possibility of autonomy in art and in social life. Within this framework, I posit the, that the overarching vision of Black Mountain was to develop collective and individual autonomy rather than the output artists or artworks that would be connected to the institution. I looked at creative writing instruction in the world. The work of the Black Mountain College is an example of how autonomy is expressed in art and how these forms at once express glimpses of the autonomy that Castoriadis describes and reveal the limitations of the communal and creative autonomy that is sought. The title itself, The Sense of Horizon, is an attempt to capture the duality that captivates me about Black Mountain College and the very proposition of autonomy. A sense of a horizon gestures towards something unreachable yet visible, a place that can be strove for but life may never. For Castoriadis, politics is a collective activity whose object is the institution of a society as such. The continuous participation of the collective is required for a society to retain its coherence and to remain legible as a political structure. So Castoriadis identifies politics both as an activity and as, an object, as, and as the object of that activity. This formulation does not suggest that the object of politics to establish a society as a society is actually possible. Societies exist under the constant possibility for conflict to erupt or for relations to shift with, within or from outside of the collective. Perpetual this, this perpetual instability renders permanent designation as a, society, as a society impossible. Therefore, the object of politics is to re recognize this precarity, to recognize this precarity, and shift the society's structures and design as needed. This is the activity of politics perpetual struggle for society to transform its relations to its institution. For society to survive change, it must be ready to change itself. So the chapter that I'm going to be reading from, entitled Proximities, Autonomy, Heteronomy, and the Avant-Garde Manifesto, looks to the Black Mountain aesthetic traditions to highlight the linkages between uh, Black Mountain aesthetics and preceding European avant-garde movements. The avant-garde manifesto is born out of a desire to disrupt traditional aesthetic values and artistic standards by positing ones that appear to be completely novel. These propositions are often startling and transgressive 
as the writer disregards the popular markers that are relied upon to identify art and literature as such. I find it crucial to specify the stakes of a critical discussion about the avant garde manifesto from the outset. Such a discussion brings dimension to the designation of radicality, which is often ascribed to a project that deviates sharply from cultural and or aesthetic convention. The avant garde manifesto exemplifies the inherent closeness between that which immediately appears to be opposites. More specifically, the manifesto illuminates how any articulation of autonomy can also operate as a main statement of unevenly held power and hierarchical control. The democratic society does not understand itself as epistemologically constituted, is the originator of its own structures, laws, and norms. The democracy uh, is a society that recognizes itself as the source of its own institution and continuing coherence, and this inalienable ability to decide is the most crucial feature. It is also reminiscent of a democratic political rhetoric that refers to self-determination as freedom. Indeed, Castoriadis understands freedom as the articulation of intentional human action and autonomy as the full expression of this freedom. If democracy is the full expression of society's autonomy, that leads me to question what holds sway in the absence of autonomy. In response to that question, Castoriadis proposes the notion of heteronomy. Um, as the opposite of autonomy, which she describes as the legislation or regulation by another. In a political context, another is an entity that retains power over a society and institutions and its individuals. Though in a position of superiority over the collective, this entity does not necessarily exert itself from the outside. In its various forms, heteronomy is a rejection of the socio historical phenomena. Reflection and participation are discouraged as the collective and individual default to a superior form of determinant. Political life is organized into hierarchies and naturalizes cohesiveness and reduces the collective sense of influence. As a result, the collective's diminished position appears as an ape rather than a feature of their own society's design. This psychic influence or regulation of the imagination, as Castoriadis refers to it, is a full control over the human psyche or soul, which he also uh, considers the imagination as synonymous term. Via the individual imagination and the collective social imaginary, Karani instills and enforces the dominant forms of knowledge in order to dissuade any consideration of life otherwise. Castoriadis attributes the political centrality of the imagination to two connotations of the word. First, its connection with images in the most general sense, those forms that are visible to the eye. And second, the connection with the idea of invention, or more specifically, with creation. In this context, the social imaginary must create the images in the visual sense, or rather the social uh, creates markers of meaning that shape psychically how people relate to their society and one another. Gessoriatis refers to these composite images as social imaginary significations. These significations allow society to differentiate themselves from that which, the, which exists outside of it. Um, and I quote from Gessoriatis, my, our creation of a world entails also the creation of your the society recognizes numbers as part of the in group requires a simultaneous identification of another whose differentiating features are externalized and distanced. In this way, significations are an intrinsic feature of the social imaginary. The heteronymous society appropriates significations to foreclose the political participation of the collective. This concentration of political power serves to disempower the collective and it estranges the entire society from the rest of the world. Considering the, considering the reality making abilities of the imagination, it can be seen why its regulation is just as vital as the as institutional legislation. The imagination is ontological, giving shape and dimension to things. This represents Castoriadis' two conversations. Images and forms that create significance, that create significance, that influence how society comprehends itself in relation to the outside. The dominant conceptualization of creation is a political participation. The autonomous society acknowledges that all facets of their uh, society are self foundational. This understanding of creation urges the collective to problematize and transform their relationships to their own institutions. The society is open. As it was created by the people, the people retain the capacity to transform it. 
further autonomous individuals in order for them all types of activity beyond their influence for their society as a static entity. And the autonomous and the social imaginary in such a society did not equate present circumstances with permanence. However, most societies are instituted heteronomously or via closure of meaning, meaning, wherein the individual sense of potentiality has been so diminished that challenging existence laws or norms seem mentally unconceivable or psychically unbearable. Without any sort of influence over reality, a heteronomous individual is in an ontological crisis. Within a condition of political estrangement, looking beyond existing significations is an impossible proposition. Proposed of heteronomous individuals, the social imaginary becomes insulated and dedicated to conformity. Questioning then, is a radical intervention in the act of closure of meaning, destabilizing the status of our own. This self reflexivity indicates our autonomy. As heteronomy regulates the imagination, autonomy creates an ontological opening as the result of expression. So, I'm going to share. Sorry, I'm some editing on this page. Autonomy liberates the imagination from the existing significations of organized society and social life, therefore, constructing a new ontological ethos, which in English roughly translates to another self and another world. Autonomy shifts perception as it requires the comprehension that reality is socio historically produced rather than epistemologically predetermined. Indeed, Castoriotis' connotations of imagination are matters of perception, the identification of the other, the unshakability of society's structure, the feasibility of having a political life. The heteronomous closure of meaning is a narrow and a constriction of atheists. In a democratic society, the collective is not obliged to remain within a closed field of instituted and collectively accepted significations. The individual, wherein I'm not going to transition to discuss the individual as the artist, has an unspoken permission and a personal impetus to create work that may dissent from existing significations, norms, or institutional values. Art is then, in this society, made a mode of self-questioning, a continuous positing of new ways of being within society and with oneself. The artist, in short, has a rhetorical agency to create autonomy. The heteronomous society is self-contained. The answer to any speculative question can be found within existing institutions and significations. The avant-garde artists and totalitarian uh, ruler in such society, so we can understand a prominent example of the heteronomous society in 20th century. The answer to any speculative question in existing institutions and significations. The avant-garde artists and the totalitarian ruler are connected by a rejection of the artist may disregard existing canons and set their own aesthetic precedents, and the dictator raises and rebuilds society in their own image. Their aspirations may diverge, or both are motivated by extremes. The dictator will abolish any social norms or institutions that do not align with their vision of an ideal society. The artist is unconcerned that the never ending demand for newness could become stagnant, stagnant and authoritative. The avant garde desire to make art and life indistinguishable propagates an aesthetic uh, prescriptiveness that resonates with the totalitarian desire of being reformed. The relation between the artistic avant-garde and totalitarian indicates this close proximity between radicality and the suppression of imagination, um, upon which um, heteronomy and autonomy are constantly kind of tilted in the line. Um, I'm actually not really, I'm just going to be honest with you, I'm not sure how I'm at this point, if you want to stay, uh, I can keep going, or I just like realized like, I'm going to talk a little bit. Maybe you want to just finish the next discursive chunk. And, um... Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, this next section kind of like locates projective verse within the European avant garde that preceded and kind of tied to like the concepts I've been talking about so far. The Black Mountain College is considered a foundational site of 20th century homogenism. From the outset, Black Mountain aesthetics were steeped in a legacy of European experimentalism that was brought to the United States 
by um, educators like Joseph and Ani Alvarez, who love the novel following these closure policies. Instruction synthesized the cross disciplinary action based ethos that the Bauhaus and American progressive education share. As the Black Mountain poets formed the School of Literary Pottery in the 1940s and 50s, the avant gardist emphasis on lived experience and social conditions resonated with the free verse approach that was more concerned with affective conveyance than with meter or line. Such an intentional departure from an inherited political convention, poetic, excuse me, convention, made Black Mountain an appropriate venue for poetic experimentation. It was at Black Mountain where the poet Charles Ocean. Charles Olson wrote projected verse, which would become the de facto manifesto of a new generation of experimental American poets. In its entirety, projected verse captures the larger Black Mountain project, weaving education and the arts as a tool for development and altering the forms of social life into deep and political engagement. At the same time, the essay adequately demonstrates how gestures of autonomy also contain features of heteronomous uh, control and closure. Projected verse is recognizably avant-garde as it poses a challenge to the art life distinction and advocates for art that addresses reality and is written in a recognizably masculine style characteristic to early avant-garde literary movements. Perhaps more importantly, the categorization of manifesto uh, positions the content as radical and the author is making intervention in the inactive parallel disclosure. While the avant-garde manifesto is surely a transgression, from inherited norms and convention, it also exists that uh, enforces existing forms of hierarchy and control. In her 1999 book, Manifesto, as Provocations of the Modern, Janet Lyon explains the, the 19th century avant garde usage of the manifesto as an adaptation of revolutionary discourse by artists, artistic groups in order to make their own radical departures from bourgeois society uh, and artistic forms of practice. Lyon goes on to explicate the tendency of the artistic avant-garde manifesto to paradoxically reinstate the oppressive and hierarchical features of the milieu they wish to, re they wish to reject. I quote, given the commitment on the part of groups in the historical avant-garde to reintegrate political and artistic programs in the service of an anti-bourgeois ideal, it is all the more remarkable that the avant-garde's attack on art as institution rejects the deliberative discourse of the bourgeois public sphere and yet at the same time retains the gender and often uh, radicalized marking that structured bourgeois aesthetic discourse. With the capacity to simultaneously regulate and liberate the imagination, as Castoriadis understands the imagination, the artistic avant-garde appeals to two poles of radicality. As the manifesto fervently advocates for a new aesthetic order, it also exemplifies how the radicality of the avant-garde can be a tool for heteronomy as totalitarianism and autonomy of the free imagination of a democratic society. This duality can be traced from two influential essays in the, of the European avant-garde to Olsen uh, and Black Mountain at this century. The 1912 polemic, A Slap in the Face of Public Taste, of the, of public taste by the Russian futurist group Hylea, which was a group of poets. Um, the Bauhaus Manifesto program written in 1919 by the German architect and Bauhaus founder Walter Gropius and Charles Olson's uh, seminal 1950 work, Projected Works. The early manifestos of the movement demonstrate the historic proximity between the artistic avant-garde and totalitarian, totalitarianism, illuminating the twofold nature of avant-garde pre a radicality that pre prefigures and shapes projected works. Um, I think I'm gonna leave it there. Great, okay. thank you. So, Allison C. Smith is an independent curator and writer with an artistic and academic practice currently living in Los Angeles. They received their MA in Aesthetics and Politics from Cal Arts School of Critical Studies in 2021 and their BA in Art History at Skidmore College in 2017. Smith completed their thesis on the career practices of Julie Tolentino and E. Laris Cohen within the politics of three performance studies. They presented academic materials at conferences, including the Cultural Studies Association and the UCLA Theater of Performance Studies Graduate Conference. 
They're the recipient of curatorial internships and fellowships at the Whitney Museum of Feminist Art, the Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum, and Hauser and Ward. Currently, they work at the Mac Center for Art and Architecture as the exhibitions and programs manager. So, um, well, welcome to the recording. <laughs> Black Lives Matter protests to this repeated list of events where violence and 